Hi, everybody. Uh, so uh, Arjun works on uh, log management at Qualys, and I work on web application vulnerability scanner engine. And we don't have any hardware hacking experience, so we're going to our talk is going to be uh, is going to be focused on uh, remote access uh, to the cameras. So closer to uh, Christmas time, I started receiving emails like from the deal alerts that I can get a wireless IP camera for under 70 bucks. So I thought, yeah, why not? Uh, let's do some research. And just searching in the Google for indoor wireless IP camera, like first three results are uh, about false cam cameras. So I just got one. And while I was waiting for that camera to be delivered, I looked at Amazon's uh, product page of the camera and there are already interesting things listed, like it can stream data, it can email and FTP it to you, which means it probably stores the credentials, and uh, it'd be interesting to see how they manage that. Plus, they, uh, they refer to uh, port forwarding as a uh, simple, something simple to do. So we're really... Uh, looking forward to get the camera and start playing with it. And uh, so what the camera is, we're, we're going to talk about this particular model, uh, FOSCAM FI8910W, which is MJPEG camera, which means they just stream uh, JPEG files one after another through over HTTP. Uh, but there are a lot of other vendors that probably use the same uh, firmware, and we are sure they are using the same uh, software that FOSCAM develops, or maybe some other company develops it for FOS FOSCAM. We don't really know that, uh, those details. But we know that a lot of MJPEG cameras uh, that are available are using the same uh, software comp components. Uh, so yeah, it runs UC Linux, which is like embedded, embedded Linux kernel, very uh, stripped almost nothing on it, uh, except the kernel itself. And, and this uh, board support package is also available from uh, the board vendor. So we were able to uh, cross-compile and build our own ex uh, executives, executables. And the, uh, we're gonna use the terms that FOSCAM uses, uh, they call every component of the system uh, a firmware, but it's not really a firmware, it's a f just a binary file, but we're gonna use the firmware word just to stick to uh, their uh, conventions. So, uh, oops, sorry. So yeah, it basically consists of, uh, there are three main components. System, uh, which includes the, 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 the kernel itself and the, executable, which is one single executable, and all the CGI calls and embedded web server and probably drivers for the camera itself are packed in one binary file. Web UI, which is uh, a file that contains uh, the, the static HTML, uh, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and some image files that are going to be served uh, through uh, over HTTP, and settings file, which stores the camera settings and all your credentials and all uh, configuration that would customize your camera. I'll just briefly just go over what the files look like. So this system firmware is a custom binary file. It starts with a header, uh, like 20 bytes or something. There are two different versions, but they are almost the same. And uh, yeah, four bytes of magic number and then sizes of two files, Linux bin and ROMFS image, and the files themselves. And yeah, you can see that Linux bin is zipped version of file and ROMFS. Uh, the details are, uh, you can mount this ROMFS in your, on your Linux using the regular mount, and you can find details uh, uh, by this link how to deal with ROMFS. It's read-only file system, there's nothing 
fancy. And web UI, it just looks like this. Uh, we, we don't work for Amazon. It's just Artem's apartment with Amazon box. We just received something. Bigger camera, maybe. And web UI is simple HTML uh, and some helper JavaScript, which basically is for making CGI calls to the camera and to get some functionality out of it. it web UI is just a wrapper around CGI API. And uh, yeah, all communication is in plain text. Uh, they use basic server authentication, and you can make a, make a call to CGI either by providing this uh, how it called Author authority part of the URL, like providing username and password separated with colon, and or you can provide the credentials as a query string. Oh, it didn't fit on the slide, sorry. Uh, this, after video stream, that's CGI, question mark, there is username equals user, and pa PWD equals password. They are both equal. And yeah, Web UI is also a custom file uh, with a header, and there is <laughs> some kind of protection implemented, uh, so-called checksum, uh, and we experimentally figured out that this checksum is a uh, sum of all bytes starting offset C. Uh, there's on the next slide. So, yeah, th that's a header. And then uh, after header section starts the actual file names with file name sizes, then file size, then file itself. It's sort of a tar, if you wish. And setting section is a fixed sized five kilobytes uh, file that directly mapped into the memory of the camera. And it's also very simple, like header with checksum, with the same algorithm for checksum, it sum of all bytes starting byte C, uh, starting offset C. It contains all the sensitive information, uh, like all your credentials for the camera, your network settings, your Wi-Fi settings and credentials, uh, email credentials, if you set up your camera to send out you, uh, the snapshots of what's happening, or if there's some movement detected. Uh, and surprisingly, for example, on their tutorial video, which most uh, housewives, for example, are gonna follow, they uh, use Gmail as an example, and like, a lot of people provide Gmail credentials in the camera to send um, that information to their Gmail accounts. And Settings file is the same, like uh, third word is the checksum. So there's some, we're gonna start, uh, yeah, and after providing this brief overview, now uh, you would ask how we get into that camera. They have usernames, they, have, they use basic server authentication. If you cannot sniff the traffic, how are you gonna access it? So. There are two uh, major sort of vulnerabilities, or I don't know how to call it. Probably, yeah, it's vulnerability. So this authentication bypass uh, was reported in mid-March by these two French guys, Arnaud and Frederic. And uh, there's some history behind this vulnerability. So initially, like three, four releases back, you would be able to access the al alias of the memory by just requesting this first link, like camera URL and then double slash pro K core, and you get uh, 16 megabytes? Yeah, yeah 16. 16 megabyte file dump, which ac is actually the camera memory which contains all the, everything. And then they patched it by not allowing uh, any alphanumeric characters after, uh, if there are two forward slashes. So bypass would be just level up. And uh, then they fixed that too, and uh, current version, the latest one, doesn't have that vulnerability, but some flavors of them, uh, this, the, the third one, the Spanish one, we discovered, but I don't know, maybe it's the same thing, it's just a matter of which particular firmware you are playing with, because version could be the same, it ends with 48, but some 48s are vulnerable to this and some are, are not. But yeah, you can do the Spanish or some directory that exists on, uh, on the camera and you do two level up and then pro K core and you get the same dump. 
And also this, uh, those guys uh, found this privilege escalation URL where you could have uh, an, a username, uh, a, a user of the camera with operator uh, role. There are three roles. It could be guest, operator, and administrator. And if you have somehow got access to the camera as an operator, you can dump the memory in, I think in, even in the latest firmware, uh, through this URL. And kcore file. First of all, yeah, as I said, it maps that settings file twice. First at offset three megabytes and another one at offset five megabytes. And you have your old uh, camera, for example, uh, credentials right in that file. You can do strings on that file. You, you'll find everything, or you can use our tool that we are gonna, Artyom I'm gonna show later, that would automatically extract everything for you. Uh, it also contains some information on uh, local, on intranet, intranet. Uh, for example, I found my iPhone's IP and name in that file, plus I found my printer information in that file, probably uh, that camera has UPnP functionality too. They probably send some kind of um, broadcast messages and they store the replies. Uh, so yeah, so uh, this path traversal is applicable to any camera. If you are targeting someone, you know he has the camera and you know he might open some email from you. Uh, the CSRF vulnerability could be useful. We filed a CV for it a couple of days ago. Um, I don't know, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of people knew about this, but nobody documented it, so we did. So basically, for example, you, you, can, CSR, uh, you can do a CSRF attack on any f CGI call of the camera, because browser would cache uh, the basic server authentication for you, and whoever would open this URL with uh, already being authenticated. Uh, it's just gonna make a request to the camera with these parameters and f this one, for example, would add a user CSRF with password CSRF with admin privileges. And every, uh, every CGI call could be accessed uh, like this. And so just to summarize, so if you want to get a camera or Besides buying one, you can get a camera by either in the wild, by, uh, uh, by going to Shodan, uh, that's great search engine, uh, and search for NetWave IP camera, um, and it would, uh, Artem would go deeper into this. And uh, yeah, just vast majority of cameras would still have this path traversal vulnerability, or you can always do login brute force because they have no, uh, protection whatsoever, like no throttle downing, the connection rate or and nothing like that. So, uh, and uh, password and user fields are uh, 12 byte long, so it would be pretty easy to brute force. Or if it's a targeted attack, you do the CSRF or click jacking because they don't do any uh, anti-framing protection. No, uh, yeah, nothing. Not, not through JavaScript, not through, uh, what was the header? Uh, X frame options, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, from now on, we are assuming you somehow got access to the camera. So, uh, what's next? And Arthur would tell you. So, once, once you got access to the camera, so here are some things that you can do. So, apart from the obvious things like, you know, grabbing the video stream or acquiring all the credentials which are stored in a camera, like, you know, email, FTP, it can store your ADSL password, your Wi-Fi password, and it's basically, as you have seen, it, it is like a pretty nice scanner of the intranet, so you can, you know, just dump the camera memory and see what other things are out there. So. You can, in principle, think of this camera as just uh, a small Linux box with, you know, an ARM, ARM machine with very limited amount of memory and, and CPU, but it's a, it's a fully-fledged Linux box. So you can, in principle, run arbitrary software on it, and you can think of something like a botnet bot or, you know, an anonymizer proxy or, you know, just a scanner for an intranet, or since it's the web server, after all, you can use it to host your malware, 
And from another point of view, it's also, you can think of it as a box on the intranet, which is accessible from internet. So it can be like a platform for advancing your attack further into the network. And it also can be used as, uh, again, as a platform to attack the browser of the victim, because you can always use that web server. And you can also use the, since you, I will show later how you can modify the web interface of the camera. You can use it as, a, a, you know, to put so something like a beef there, like browser exploitation. Persistent cross site scripting. Yeah. Browser ex to host the browser exploitation framework and get a hook into victim's browser. So um, now let's pick some numbers because, okay, if you have one camera or two, but in fact, what is interesting here is that you have hundreds of thousands of these cameras out there. So just according to Shodan, uh, there are about 100,000, uh, Shodan knows about 100,000, uh, so this is our findings, but I have heard some other people speaking about much bigger numbers. But anyway, there is at least about 100,000 uh, cameras uh, uh, out there, and the number is growing. And the funny thing is that if you go to, for example, um, like three hours before I was to fly to Amsterdam, I bricked a camera that I had, I had so I had to run to a store to buy one. So when I went there, you know, you find them in a uh, home security section. So they sell these devices as something, you know, to, to secure your home. But, you know, in fact, it's, you're just buying a big bridge. But nevertheless, those are very popular. So the, the, the numbers are growing. And, um, yeah, so just to, if you want to find these cameras on Shodan, you just have to, enter this NetWave IP camera in search, and this is the HTTP server header that the camera uh, replies with. So this is how Shodan identifies those cameras. The other way to find cameras is the DDNS. So since this is a very consumer-oriented product, the camera vendors, what they do, they provide a, a DDNS service. So what happens is that uh, each camera has, a, like, pre-assigned host name. And what happens is that whenever you hook the camera to the network, first thing it does, it dials back home saying that this is me. So that in their DNS server, there is a record which associates this kind of hard-coded host name which your camera came from with, with your IP address. You can, of course, shut this off. And there are some vendors which implement this using not DNS, but by using a web server. Like, uh, they, they have an Apache, so, you know, you, you, you go to their web server and then they s send a 302 with the reply to you, with, with your actual IP address, but the, the principle, the idea is the same. So just out of curiosity, you know, one lazy <laughs> afternoon, what I did, I just, so, uh, yeah, and the format, the format, again, for usability purposes, the, the, this, uh, Host names, all the host names follow certain format depending on a vendor. So for example, for FOSCOM, it is two letters followed by four digits. So what I did, I just wrote a sh shell script which I just scanned the entire DNS namespace for, for this FOSCOM. So it turned out that there have been about 140,000 records with, with valid IPs. Uh, so, uh, so because, in fact, they have, I think, uh, because of some security, uh, you know, consideration, they didn't want to allow uh, their, so creating new records in their DNS. So what they did, they just predefined all the records. But the records which have no value, they just put 127.001. So when I say valid, I mean all the IPs except for, for the local host. So I scanned the DNS and I found like 140,000 valid IPs. Out of those, at the point when I was doing scan, 41,000 actually responded to ping. And out of those, 70, uh, 7, well, 7,200 had a web server running on port 80. Now, not all of these, of course, are cameras because, in fact, most of the cameras are behind NAT. So what you see in the DNS is the IP address of the router 
which they used to, to get to the internet, but, and, uh, but some of them are connected directly and some of them have this port forwarding. So because one of, again, one of the biggest problems with these cameras is that uh, the way how vendors recommend to set them up is broken, is, is very bad. So uh, that's why you have, you know, people just do the port forwarding on port 80 and expose their cameras to the, to the internet. So uh, out of those, there were actually 2,600 cameras which were actually cameras which I was looking for. And uh, I didn't scan any other port apart from 80. I just scanned only one vendor. So it would be pretty safe to assume that if you're really after it, you can really find in no time thousands of, of these cameras. So, right. Uh, now, actually, we were supposed to, to, to give a demo, and that's why, you know, like three hours before going to the airport, I was running to the shop to buy a camera. So I bought the camera, it was okay, brought them in, so, and then, you know, we came here. So first thing we did, we wanted to, you know, to make sure that everything works. So I went to speaker lounge, set everything up, hooked, hooked up the camera, and I successfully bricked it. So, uh, it was like Murphy's Law in action, but what happened is that actually, uh, if, if you go to speakers lounge, they, they have this place where you actually connect your camera to the power, and it's very flaky. So what happened is that while I was updating the firmware, someone touched it, and you know the power went up and down. So bad luck. But we, we nevertheless, we we couldn't. Uh, you know, we knew that something will go wrong, so we made a, a screencast at, uh, when, when, when we were at home. So I'm going to, to show you the screencast, and I hope you won't be very disappointed. So, um, so what, uh, actually what we're going to demonstrate here is several things. So first we're going to, so we're taking a vanilla camera. We actually were not demonstrating how to, we assume that we know the password because Getting really getting the password is is, is trivial, so uh, you just have to dump the memory and from read it from the from the predefined offset. So what we do afterwards? So we create a backdoor. So we create an admin admin user and then modify a web interface in a way that we poison it basically. So when the legitimate user goes to the web interface, she doesn't see anything. So uh, the next thing we do. We add the hook, we uh, inject a JavaScript to the victim's browser, and the idea is to, we can do several things there, and I, I will show. And the last thing is we modify the, the camera firmware. So what we do, we install a proxy server on the camera, and uh, it's written in a way that if, so if, if the legitimate user is trying to is, is you know opening a connection to it then it forwards the then it forwards traffic to the normal to the That's legitimate cool. application but uh, otherwise it, it is used as a proxy and Sergey will talk about it uh, in, in more detail so here are the steps that needs to be that need to be performed for uh, poisoning the web user interface now um, it, it, it could have been much simpler in a sense that, you know, we could just replace the web interface with one version. But the thing is that our idea was that it doesn't make much sense just to put something random on a camera because the owner will notice very quickly and will take it down. So what we do here, we, we first try to figure out what is the, the version of the firmware that's running on the camera. So we find the same version we modify it, we, so we unpack it, then we modify it, and we pack it back, we verify that the checksums match and everything, then we push it to the camera and um, clean up the logs. Now, these blue parts that you see here, this is actually, so we actually developed a small toolkit for, for doing this. Uh, so, you know, for extracting and packing web UI system firmware and also settings. And also we just put a 
small script together, which lets to make to perform all these steps, you know, in one go as as a single command. So I'm going to. Oops. So I'm going to show you the screencast now. Is it a PDF? No. It will be funny if the screencast doesn't work. So. Okay, so um, so f the first thing, first thing that we do here is we just I think you just paused it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we first show that you know we have a camera. It has a user admin empty password. We log into it. We just show that everything works. It's just me and Sergey sitting there recording the webcast. So um, then we navigate to. So this is this is how the web UI looks. You have probably seen this. Oh no! So this is the this is how the administrative part of the web UI looks like, and this is the list of users of the camera. So it's just vanilla camera, just out of the box, fresh. So it's only admin user with uh, with no password, empty. So what we're going to do? We're going to inject a new user in in position eight. And this is the and okay. this is the script that we run to to um, to poison the web UI. So as as you can see, this uh, writing is in green. So it finds the right, figures out the version of web UI, then uh, finds the matching version, verifies that it's it's correct, then unpacks it, puts our patches in place packs everything back together and pushes it back to the camera. Now, when it pushes back to the camera, as you can see, the camera becomes unresponsive because it needs some time to, to reboot uh, and put the new web UI in place. And you see that nothing is going on. I'm hitting refresh, but there is uh, no response from the camera. So I think I can. So yeah, I'm. I'll just forward. Yeah. So at this point, so I'm still I'm still waiting for the camera to to come back, and. I think it still has some fifty or sixty. Right, so this is what we're waiting for. So it stopped responding to pings, and the moment it comes back, it means that uh, the camera is up again, and, and we will go back to the web server. OK, so it's back. Right, so we here we log in with the new user that we just created. Instead of admin, it's hack in the box 2013 Amsterdam. And so you can see that it, it still works. And actually when it's when it's booting, it just uh, rotates around itself. And uh, so we go to user section and you see here that it's the same thing. It's just, you know, this admin user and but the new user which we just created it's not here anymore it's it's not displayed here because we we poisoned uh, the web user interface and so the next thing that is going to be demonstrated here is yeah this is again just to demonstrate that you know nothing is broken everything is working so uh the next thing that we're going to demonstrate is injecting the the javascript into the into the web ui so what happens here is that first we're going to replace the video stream with the still image that we take on the fly. So, uh, 
now, yes, this is me struggling with Firefox icon. Yeah, and as you see, you see the, so the image is now, it's, it's a static image. So a lot of people use these cameras, for example, for their garages. So, you know, if you want to break into the garage, this is what you do. So this is the JavaScript that we inserted. Again, there was an alert. And yeah, now we brought everything back. Things are still operational. Uh, I think, yes, so I think this is it for this one. So the next demo, the, the next demo is so what we're going to do, we're going to alter the, the firmware of the camera, uh, no, not, not the web user interface. So again, here steps are very similar, that we need to find the right version, unpack it, push our changes in. The difference is that it's a bit more complicated because, as Sergey told, the firmware is the Linux kernel plus this read-only file system. So what we need to do, we need to mount this read-only file system. Since it's read-only, we cannot write to it. So we have to copy it over, add our changes, then generate the new image out of the directory structure that we have and pack it back. And another complexity is that the thing that we're going to push to the camera, the executable, has to be cross-compiled so that it runs uh, on, on, a, on a camera. And the actual thing, again, the, the, things, the, the things in blue uh, are tools which were missing, and we, we wrote them, and it's, the code is available. Um, so. Yeah, it's just. I let Sergey explain what 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 we're we actually wrote, pushing to the camera. Yeah, first we wrote some echo server, then uh, we wrote a proxy just to demonstrate because you can compile anything on it. Yeah, it compiles any C code. We have problems with compiling threads, but it's solved. Because the Linux kernel is is very old. It's old, yeah. Uh, but yeah, proxy is just acts as a reverse proxy. Is whoever connects to it doesn't know it's a proxy, and it so just. Uh, cameras, web server would respond to the responses to, uh, to the request to proxy. But if somebody knows that it's a proxy, uh, the proxy server would act as a proxy server, normal, normal proxy server. Like for example, if it's a connect keyword in the beginning of the request, that means it tries to establish a tunnel to google.com port 443 and it just acts as a normal proxy. So, yeah. And point is that since the owner of the, ca of the camera port forwarded or enabled only port 80, uh, our script is uh, downloading the firmware, uh, changing the listening port for the real that embedded web server to, for example, 81, and our camera listens to port 80. So it still works. Everything still works from outside of his uh, intranet. And, as well uh, as from inside, yeah. Yeah, as well as from inside. So, yeah, so the next is again another uh, screencast. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, again it starts by demonstrating that. Uh, uh, Everything works. Then, then we launch this script, which does everything. You know, which just automates uh, all the steps that I just described. Yeah, as you can see, we're changing the original port of on which camera listens. We're just bumping it up, and then uh, it. Uh, I can just maybe. Yeah, so what we do here, we change the port and we find the right version of the firmware, we verify the integrity. So we uh, extract it, then we push our binary to it, we regenerate the file system image, then regenerate the uh, firmware image, and we push it to the, yeah, we're uploading it back to the camera. And once it's back, you know, so, Actually, what happens here is that we do this HTTP post, we get 
the HTTP 200 OK back, but then still we have to wait for some time until the firmware is um, extracted. extracted and you know applied and uh, the camera is rebooted. So I think we can fast forward here a bit. So yeah, here. So yeah, again, it is, you see that. Uh, we were waiting for the camera to, to reboot. It's not responding to, to anything. So, yeah. Now, when it, when it comes back, what we want to see, we still want to see that uh, the, the, the videos, that, that it is still working and that is the video stream is still available on the same port. So here is just uh, the proxy starts shortcut. Most likely. Short, yeah. So it's a shortcut URL to just to demonstrate the video stream. But the difference is that it's now the traffic is going through our proxy, and you see it's it's a normal browser, and you know we we type in the the URL of the of the proxy and it still works. Now, what we do next, and yeah. So what we do next here, we just enable a proxy. So we, we make our browser to use the, the camera, so you can see the IP of the camera, and port is, is port 80, just the same port that we just use the browser to connect to. Now we make, we use this, uh, we, we use camera as a proxy. And then what happens is, uh, so we basically try to, access Google. And I'll fast forward a bit and it works. So we type search command and yeah, and you get the result. The reason why is it, why you see this, these things here is that the, the camera is, so it is very, it has very weak CPU and what happens is that, you know, browser normally opens lots of threads and camera is, you know, it is having some hard time serving them, you know, uh, all together. And our proxy was, is also, is not written in, in the most optimal way, which is just to demonstrate uh, the proof of concept. So, and this brings me back to our next slide yet. Yeah, so this is, this is just uh, one script which lets you so do with just a, one command for you know injecting executable or poisoning web UI or if you want to specifically inject proxy just to do this extra steps of changing the port on which ca camera listens can do that too and uh, yeah. yeah that was the demo some other things to consider is how the the camera responds to denial of service attacks for example I ran uh, I pointed the tool I wrote, that slow HTTP test, which actually a uh, application layer denial of service attack simulator, uh, just to see. Well, of course, it's an embedded device and it's not going to handle too much connections, but yeah, it dies after 80, 80 concurrent connections, uh, which means it's for, for a bad guy, if he wants to disable camera functionality for a while, uh, he can launch it, yeah, he, he can knock it down in, what is it, like five, six seconds, and keep the dose condition for as much as he wants, so that's how camera, and plus, since camera doesn't log any unauthenticated requests, there are no traces of even of your denial of service attack. So, how to fix it? Um, the newer, and like more expensive, more advanced versions of cameras uh, manufactured by that FOSCAM now, uh, like starting last month, they support HTTPS connections at least, for example. But yeah, if you gonna stick with these cheaper versions of cameras, that MJPEG cameras that are under $70, uh, I, I don't know, ideally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expose it to the outside network at all because I don't know, you can still make it to send you emails or dump everything to FTP on your local network and without exposing the camera. But you, if you have to, uh, that's what we, rec we, we, we recommend. Uh,
just use some a box, some box in front of the camera, like firewall or IPS, which would run, for example, fail to ban, which would whitelist only only your IP or IPs you know. Uh, protect from brute force by throttling down connection rates, and you can also have a reverse proxy, and you have at least an HTTPS connection between the reverse proxy and the end user. And yeah, it would make sense to override response headers by not saying that you are NetWave IP, IP camera, and so script kiddies won't play with your camera, uh, found on Shodan, maybe. Um, and summary is just, uh, yeah, for hackers who just got another tool to play with the camera you own or somebody else owns. And for admins, I would start looking at the NetWave IP camera header because I, yes, I, I think there would be a lot of traffic coming from them because uh, if you can host a malware there and the IP of the camera is not compromised by Google safe URL, whatever, or the Microsoft's uh, that engine. Uh, you can host your every piece of malware on different cameras since there are hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, yeah, just look for the traffic from those cameras. And for regular users, just don't expose it. That would be the best thing to do for now. Or get more expensive camera, but who knows what other vulnerabilities are there. And we didn't go, we didn't do any hardware research. Uh, because first, we don't have any experience in hardware hacking, and second, there is a forum, Open IP Cam. Yeah, actually, we listed on the last okay, slide. Yeah. yeah, all the all the references. And yeah, these are references. Uh, Open IP Cam has a lot of very useful things, but you have to have a physical access to the camera and to the serial port. Uh, yeah, there are several tools available as well, and CGI SDK is also available by FOSCAM. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Yeah, okay. Have you uh, examined um, cameras that are more expensive than $70? So we were... Uh, so, we were just uh, targeting cameras which are based on this firmware, and normally these are, you know, the low-end consumer. Uh, we know that the same vendors have more expensive versions like uh, outdoor cameras and, and things, like, you know, with more sophisticated web interfaces, etc. but we didn't look to any of those. But how about uh, the more famous brands like Axis and Sony? Oh no, no, we we, we didn't look into 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 any other. So there are like, um, so this this uh, I don't know if if like for example Sony or Panasonic they are is, I, we we don't know if they are using the same firmware from from no, these unlikely, guys or not. Unlikely. But I don't think it's going to be likely. No, so. These are all like all Chinese uh, uh, companies, so. And they are cloning one for one company clones another from uh, firmware from another, and boards are cloned, so that's why they are all vulnerable to the same things. Thank you. Any other questions on the floor? Okay. Um, they will be around until the end of the conference. Feel free to approach them off stage as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.